Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning on this beautiful day that the Lord has given to us. Uh, today uh, we are going to be observing the 175th anniversary of our uh, uh, church by Lutheran Church uh, Missouri Synod. It was established uh, 175 years ago in the year 1847. And so we give thanks to God for uh, the, the gifts of grace that we uh, receive through the uh, teachings uh, of, the, uh, of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, with that in mind, our order of service is going to be a little different. Uh, uh, we're basically using Divine Service 3 on page 184, but just kind of note, uh, there's going to be an extra hymn in there as well, and uh, the hymns are kind of, uh, there's a description on the hymns to kind of show why we're put, putting those in there, uh, emphasize the, either the historicity of the, of the hymn or uh, what teaching is reflecting. So with that in mind, Let's go ahead and begin with our opening hymn, uh, uh, written by our first uh, LCMS president, CFW Walther. Uh, he is risen, he is risen, hymn number 480. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I shall confess my transgressions unto the Lord.
Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I was heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we continue with the intro found printed in our bulletins this morning. Let your steadfast love comfort me. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Those who fear fear you shall see me and rejoice. I know, O Lord, that your just decrees are righteous. Let your mercy come to me that I may live. strength of all who trust in you. Without your aid, we can do no good thing. Grant us the help of your grace that we may please you in both will and deed through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
The Old Testament lesson for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from the prophet Amos, the 6th chapter. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the noble men of the first of the, first of the nations, to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kelne and see, and from there go to Hamath the great. Then go uh, down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? O you who put uh, far away the day of disaster and bring near the seed of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing uh, idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music who drink wine and bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, we continue with the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 664, Fight the Good Fight. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, the sixth chapter. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of, of faith. Uh, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. 
He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one can, has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who originally provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and be ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel and let's sing the triple Alleluia in verse on page 190. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus says, There was a rich man who was uh, clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also, also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to, uh, from, from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from here, from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that they may uh, be warned, uh, lest they come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We now make confession of our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, please be seated for our next hymn, hymn number 728, How Firm a Foundation, a hymn that teaches us that found our foundation of our faith is in God's Word alone.
Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our epistle lesson this morning, St. Paul uh, calls on young Timothy and really all of us by extension to fight the good fight of faith. He says, uh, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So what's all in entailed in this uh, good fight of faith? Well, the first thing is that we take hold of eternal life. Uh, eternal life is a gift given by God. It's uh, something that we possess even right now. It's something that we've been given as we've been called out of eternal death into life in the waters of baptism. There God rescued us. He, he, he uh, got us out of that uh, sorry state of eternal death that we were in and brought us into the eternal life and the joy of, of, of the light of Christ in the waters of baptism where he forgives our sins, where Christ's blood washes us clean uh, and where we become the very children of God. Uh, so we already have this wonderful gift. Jesus tells us, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Again, we pass from the eternal death into life. Even though the body may die, we still live in Christ. We still live in him. The second part of this entails uh, making the good confession in the presence of of many witnesses. Uh, this may sound like confirmation, right? How many of you remember your confirmation day? I'll kind of say, see more hands than that, right? Uh, hopefully you do. Uh, hopefully you're, you remember, not in a traumatized state, right? But you remember coming up before the congregation and confessing uh, your, your faith before the, the whole congregation, right? And really before the whole world. But what was that that you confessed? It was the sound doctrine that was taught to you, that was passed down from one generation to the next, to you in this generation, and that you can pass on to the next generation. Uh, and that sound doctrine is all focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ, that uh, the firm foundation of our faith is set on what Christ has done, that he died for you and for me, uh, paid the price for our sins of the cross and rose again, that we may have eternal life. And that is what we confess. Uh, but we also confess that not just before the congregation, but we confess that really before the whole world, that our life is one of a continual confession of our faith as we live uh, before others in the world. And most importantly, as we live before for God, who is always there with us. St. Paul kind of makes this connection of us making that good confession with Christ, who made that good confession before Pontius Pilate, uh, as he confessed that he is that Son of God, he is the Savior of the world, that all those, those who believe in him have eternal life. And so uh, we, uh, we get this word, this, this sound doctrine, uh, in order to... Uh, Proclaim, but we must keep that sound doctrine pure from error. And over the, uh, the centuries, over the, the, the time period of the church, there have been a lot of errors that have crept in from time to time, challenging this, this uh, sound doctrine that's been passed down from one generation to the next. It started out in the, really uh, with Christ as he proclaimed the, the word, and they had those that, were, would, uh, uh, that would fight against him. There was the apostles who... Who also had their challenges in the entire church history and Martin Luther and the challenges with the papacy uh, and even with our own uh, forefathers in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, in the year 1821 uh, they were presented a challenge uh, Frederick Wilhelm III of Prussia uh, how many of you don't remember before your history what country Prussia was it kind of and well, it, let me just explain this. It kind of encompassed a lot of European countries, included parts of Poland and Germany. And so uh, Frederick was the, the ruler of the Prussian Union. And in 1821, he decided to put forth uh, a different book for the church to use for its rights 
uh, in, uh, for the public worship of the church. The problem with that is that it was basically the reformed, uh, uh, the reformed rites that uh, he was using because he was a reformed leader. That's fine and dandy, but they were pushing this on the Lutheran churches. Now, this, uh, what's, what's so dangerous about this is that um, in the Reformed teaching, there is no such thing as baptismal regeneration. Baptism is nothing more than mere water. It is a sign uh, of, of God bringing you into faith or a sign of, of your commitment to Christ. But it doesn't do anything other than that. It's just a sign. It's just water poured over you. Then the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is just nothing more than a memorial meal. It's just uh, bread and wine. And it, does, and it doesn't teach Christ's body and blood. Uh, they also like to get rid of confession absolution. They say, well, how can a man forgive uh, the sins of others? Well, uh, we do so in the, in the stead of Christ. And that's what Christ commanded uh, the apostles in the church in, in uh, John chapter 20. And so this, this teaching, this, this corruption of the gospel really is an attack uh, 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 at God's word in the sacraments that these are means of grace by which God comes to us and brings us salvation. And they start turning the, everything into a works righteousness. Uh, that somehow uh, they're saved either because of the things that you do or something inherently in you. Uh, and, and so that was a, an, an issue. And so uh, the Lutheran pastors resisted. And those that resisted were thrown in jail. Bat Lutheran baptis baptisms were declared to be invalid. Um, and those churches that didn't go along with the program had Reformed pastors forced into their congregations. Uh, so what were they to do? So uh, C.F.W. Walther and, and the... the a uh, group from Germany that came over to America uh, and landed in Perry County, Missouri, uh, decided that they're going to leave. And as they arrive in America, uh, they have all this firmly in mind. They want to keep the pure teaching of God's word. And so the very first building they built is a log cabin. It wasn't for somebody's house. It wasn't for administrative purposes. It was to be a seminary. So that those men that came along who were seminary students who wanted to study for the ministry could be trained so that as they fight the good fight of faith, they can continue to pass this faith on to the next generation. And uh, they thought they, they had everything uh, really good here in America with the freedom of religion. A uh, short time after that, a few years after that, uh, there was another group of Lutherans in the United States uh, that heard about them. That they were, they were like-minded, and they came together in 1847 and formed uh, the Lutheran Church of Missouri, Ohio, and other states, uh, otherwise known as the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. It was shortened over the years, uh, so that we have a nice acronym. No, not really. Uh, it's just shortened just to make it easier to identify uh, us as a synod. Um, and so they thought they had it really good and easy, but, you know, the devil loves to work and, and likes to stir up division. He likes to stir up um, all sorts of errors in the church. And so uh, he does so in 1855. Uh, Samuel S. Schmucker, he is part of the General Assembly, and this is probably the largest uh, Lutheran denomination uh, at the time. Uh, it's where it's kind of going back to before the Revolutionary War. And uh, he put forth a definite synodical platform. And in there, he wants to rewrite some of the Lutheran uh, teachings again. And what does he want to rewrite? Baptism, Lord's Supper, and Confession and Absolution. Again, teaching the, the Reformed idea that that's just plain water, the, it's just a memorial meal on the altar, and uh, no man has a right to say he forgives your sins. Uh, that's what they're putting forward. It was, a, again, a, an attack against the gospel. And, of course, C.F.W. Walther and, our, and those in Missouri Sin uh, refused to go uh, along with that uh, particular idea. And, and they, they, they were very much fervent in teaching in America the sound Lutheran doctrine, that good confession, that sound doctrine that we have in the scriptures. Uh, so much so that C.F.W. Walther became known as the American Luther. Uh, he was very well known 
uh, as he uh, tackled uh, not only these issues, but other issues uh, like uh, the election issue in the uh, late 1800s and other issues that came along as well. But this has always been part of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Sin. Always had the idea that we fight that good fight of faith, that we make that good confession before the world. In order to do that, we must have and hold on to that sound teaching. And in the late, uh, 1970s, we became very close to losing that. In the 1970s, we had what was called the Battle of the Bible. Who remembers the Battle of the Bible, if you're living around that time? Uh, a couple of people, right? What, what was the Battle of the Bible about? Don't just see the Bible, because we know that. <laughs> you remember, Ron? Do you remember? Not exactly. Not exactly. Okay. Uh, it, it was over uh, whether the Bible was God's word or if it just contained God's word, right? Yeah, so uh, if, if the Bible is word for word God's word, then everything written in it is faithful and true. Uh, if it just contains God's word, well then... There's the idea that not every word in the Bible is true. So uh, they make such th uh, so, some stories in the Bible to be fairy tales or myths, like Jonah, for instance, right? Was Jonah swallowed by a big fish and then regurgitated later on land and went to Nineveh preach? Uh, they say that was nothing more than a myth. Creation in Genesis 1 2 becomes nothing more than a nice creation story. And, and uh, to replace it, well, you replace it with the theory of evolution. Uh, miracles are attacked. The virgin birth has been attacked uh, through this teaching. And if you kind of wonder why things are so bad in American Christianity, it's because primarily of this idea of how we approach the scriptures, that it is nothing more than just a book that contains God's word. And so it makes a huge difference. And so as we see this battle, this good fight of faith of, of our forefathers, we see that we can have to continue that good fight of faith as well as God equips us as we've been handing down that good confession from our forefathers. And, and so what are we to confess in this world today? Well, there is a lot of things that uh, we have to confess that me, our forefathers, didn't even have to deal with. Some of them did, but uh, not all of them. There, there's the idea of racism. Uh, racism was tackled in the 60s, but now there's a resurgence of racism through critical race theory. And so as God's people, we hold forth that all people are created in the image of God. We don't look at people based on the color of their skin, but uh, really by the content of their character, as uh, Dr. King uh, tried to uh, teach. Um, we, we hold forth that we are all created equal in the image of God. And that runs into problems because we don't look at those distinctions where, that, where people are seeking to divide uh, one group of people from another. We uphold the gift of life. We uphold that life is precious in the sight of God from, from the conception in the womb and even to the tomb or, or, or the conclusion of our life in this world. Um, I don't like to say natural death because death is not natural but to the conclusion of our life in this world. And there's those that will say, you know, some life is more precious than others. You know, if that baby is wanted, it's a little bit more precious than the one that isn't wanted. Or on the other end of life, you know, as people get older and, and our health starts to fail, there's those that are quickly to say, well, you know, you're kind of becoming a burden on others. And so uh, <coughs> your life is no longer as valuable as it once was. That's what society is teaching, this culture of death. But... We have a message that says all of life's presence. There is no difference in the value of your life from the time you're conceived until you're done here in this world. You are valuable in God's eyes. So much so that he sends his son for you. Right? He created you. He redeemed you. And he has called you to faith in Jesus Christ. There's other things that we must uphold in our uh, uh, today. Uh, marriage is one of them. Uh, mar marriage is a gift from God. Marriage is that which is established by God, not by government. Government has no right to change what marriage is. God alone has established it, and he established it as one man and one woman in holy matrimony. But along with that, we also reject 
uh, the teachings of uh, the sexual revolution of the 60s and in all of its manifestations as we as we call people to repentance and out of this out of this sin both those who are involved in homosexual sins but those who are involved in heterosexual sins that all of those are sins that need to be dealt with but yet in Christ there is forgiveness there's a God who loves you who calls you to repentance and who forgives all of your sins we have a God who loves not only us, but the entire world. He wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants people to come out of the sin of unbelief and hold on to his promises of salvation in Jesus Christ. But as we live in an affluent society with all these things going on, uh, one of the big dangers isn't just the false doctrines that are out there, but it's the enticements of the world as the world entices us with all the worldly goods that try to distract us from what really truly matters in this world, which is God's word. And so Paul tells us this morning, uh, but if we have food, food and clothing, uh, with these we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desire, desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. There are many, even Christians, who have, uh, as Paul said, shipwrecked their faith uh, because of unrepentance. They have wandered away from the faith because they love this world more than they love Christ. They love the things, the material things of this world more than they love the word of God. And so part of our spiritual fight of fighting that good fight of faith means that we'll also be content with all that God gives to us and blesses us with. And if something should be taken away, that we willingly let go of that because we love Christ and Him more. We fight the good fight of faith not because we are seeking to win a battle, but because Christ has already won the war. That's why we sing that first hymn this morning, He is Risen. It is a statement of Christ's victory for you and for me, that He has won that victory through His death and His resurrection. We also begin this morning with the invocation in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to remind us of who we are, that we are people who have been claimed in the waters of baptism, that we've been given that new life, that gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ, that He has washed away our sins and has called us to live in that new life as a as part of that good confession of our faith that we live before the world. And we also know that as we come for the Lord's Supper, there's Christ there with his very body and blood to heal us, to feed us, and to, uh, uh, and to, give a, to bind up our wounds from both the sins that others do to us and what we also inflict on ourselves. But as we gather this morning, it, we also recognize that Christ is the one who comes and brings us before the throne of God. That we are there before God with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing the praises of him who has saved us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. So that we can uh, go out in this world not alone but with Christ and share that wonderful news with others. And as we do so, we patiently wait for Christ's return, we patiently wait and, and remain steadfast in His Word, looking for that day when we shall sing with all the company of heaven to Him who is blessed and the only Sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Savior to life everlasting. Amen. At this time, I invite you to please stand as we sing the offertory, uh, Create in Me.
we gather our offerings this morning. I invite you to please stand as we uh, continue with the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your gifts to the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod over these past 175 years. Chiefly do we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, who alone is our salvation. By his death you have atoned for our sins. By his resurrection you have justified us. And by his word and Holy Spirit, you have brought the gospel of peace to us. We give thanks that for the 175 years in the congregations of our synod, you have richly and daily forgiven the sins of all believers. Not unto us, but unto your name, O Lord, be all glory. We implore you, O Lord, to sanctify and to keep the congregations, schools, and organizations together with all our people in the truth. Your word is truth. Preserve us from false teaching. Bring us to repentance for, uh, for every place where love or zeal has faltered. Grant us in our children bold and steadfast hearts to remain faithful to this confession and church, suffering all rather than fall away from it. And unite us with all Christians in a true confession of Jesus Christ, in whom the world has redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Lord, in your mercy. God of grace, you provide us with your holy word that we might know and believe in Christ. Make us diligent to study your word and dwell in your promises that we are content with your provision in this life and joyfully look toward the life to come. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, remember the men to whom you have given the noble task of being a pastor. Strengthen them that they might uh, be above reproach as they care for their own households as well as your church. Preserve them from every snare of the devil and give them a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, preserve our homes from idols and sins of idleness. Bless fathers and mothers as they catechize their children that generations to come might faithfully guard their hearts and rejoice in your gifts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our O Lord, you have given to man his food in due season. Uh, please be with all farmers in the midst of the harvest season. Keep them safe from all harm. And we pray for blessings upon the crops in the field that the uh, yields may be plentiful. But we also pray, Lord, that you may teach us that our daily bread does not come from highly yielding crops, but by your gracious hand. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our o King of kings and Lord of lords, watch over the authorities of this and every nation. Deliver them from the idols of wealth and power and grant that they would use their offices in service to you and those, who, uh, those you have entrusted to their care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, you afflict the faith, faithfulness and comfort. <coughs> Almighty God, you afflict in faithfulness and comfort in your steadfast love. 
Let your mercy come to Sally Bartles, Loretta Keel, Leroy Beathy, Arlene Bowling, Elaine Keel, Josephine Slavak, Jennifer Steele, Tony Lentz, Shirley Fry, and Sean Otmer. Be with all those in need of help that they might find their uh, consolation in your promises until that day yet you deliver them from all of their troubles. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you deliver your people from the sufferings of this world and comfort them with eternal rest. Receive our thanks for your, for your kindness to the saints who have gone before us and preserve us in repentance until we are carried by the angels to Abraham's side. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, especially the families of Bonnie Smith and Lauren Bartles, that they may find hope and comfort in the resurrection on the last day. Lord, in your mercy, answer all doubt and fear, O Lord, with confidence in your word and sacraments, that by these means of grace we may be kept in holiness and guarded from temptation and despair until the day when you bring all things to their perfect fulfillment and we are delivered to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. He is not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his counts upon you and grant to you his peace. Um, uh, please be seated as we sing our closing hymn. Hymn number 655, Lord keep us steadfast in your word. Blessings uh, be with each and every one of you this morning. Uh, just a few things this morning. Um, let's see here. All ladies, uh, our, the LWML Fall Workshop is going to be in a couple weeks on October the 8th at Trinity Lutheran in Auburn. Uh, so, again, all ladies are welcome to attend that event. Um, let's see here. Do we know what time, ladies? Is it starting at 8.30? Registration, 8.30. Registration, 8.30, beginning at 9. And... Uh, how long does it go for Laura? 1230. Until 1230. So it's just kind of the morning time. So uh, just invite let all ladies just and consider yourselves invited to that event. Um, also, um, there are there's chicken downstairs, drumsticks in the freezer. So please help yourself. That's given to us by it comes to poultry. And we also have uh, uh, 
uh, coupons in the back. So there's Sticks, Stones, and Bones, uh, the new uh, uh, restaurant in town. Uh, there's a 10% coupons uh, for the uh, Hidden Gem Bistro on the back table. Uh, and the coupons are good until October 31st. So please help yourself to the coupons and, and go there and enjoy uh, a, a, a nice uh, evening uh, meal sometime or, or maybe a lunch, uh, however you see fit. Um, this year, most this year, uh, just a quick other reminder that uh, uh, we're having our circuit reformation event on the, October 30th. We're having a meal with that event. Everyone's welcome, and the meal's been paid for, so there's no f uh, fee for the meal. Uh, but we do ask that if you can, please uh, let the office know, please RSVP, and let us know if you're coming so we can try to have an accurate. Uh, uh, amount or uh, uh, food available for those who come. So uh, this uh, this event is being uh, uh, given out, or everyone's invited, excuse me, to this event from not only our congregations and, and circuit, but within the district as well. So hopefully we'll have uh, quite a few people here. Um, oops, excuse me. I think that is it. Um, uh, Anything that is in the bulletin that should be announced? Yeah. I'm sorry? Somebody uh, say we need, we, Joe, we need to have a goal for the charcoal tree. Oh, yes. So we need a... So there's been some uh, discussion on when we should have the trunk or treat because uh, we normally probably would have it on that Sunday evening, but uh, we are having the Reformation event. So there's... Uh, uh, two ideas put forth. We could have it uh, on Saturday, uh, the day before, and uh, and then we could have it kind of more in the afternoon time and would not have to worry about lighting. Um, or we can do it uh, on the 31st on that Monday, uh, but uh, because of work schedules and everything, uh, might need to uh, have some extra lighting brought in. So we're trying to take a poll and just kind of see where everybody is looking where they think it might be best to have that particular event. So the question isn't whether we're going to have it or not, it's just the, the t uh, day and time. So I guess uh, if you're in favor of the Saturday time versus Monday, raise your hand. Saturday, just raise your hand. Raise your hand high so we can get a count. Okay. How about on the Monday? It's looking like more on Monday then. All right. I guess we'll make the plans from there. Anything else, Amy? Anything else, Amy? I'm thinking. Okay. I know. All right. All right. Well, I think that's it. God's richest blessings to each and every one of you, and uh, we'll see you next Sunday.